I've been thinking more now about physics, waves, the square root of minus one, um, this, you know, this idea of I and Euler's identity and all these sorts of things, and Euler's formula and whatnot. And I've watched a few videos on it, I've done a bit more research on it, and um, I'm not really going to argue with mathematicians on this sort of thing, and I'm not going to necessarily, well, I'm going to stick by my opinions on the square root of minus one. The thing is, I come at this from a physics perspective, not really a mathematics perspective. And um, if, mathematics, if mathematicians want to keep this idea of I being a rotation on the real number line into the complex plane, so-called, and that it really represents some um, rotation about the axis of zero, I guess it is, and um, uh, uh, is it I to the tau is equal to one or something, or minus one, yeah, something like that. If it goes 180 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees, I guess it's equal to minus one. And um, uh, that's, well, really, it's not equal to minus one, is it? It's equal to two, because its absolute value is equal to two then, is it not? Or, like, really, you have to trace the... Never mind, I'm going to leave all that alone, I think, and just concentrate on the, the physical implications of using I in equations. And... Um, like certain other ph physicists, as I understand it, I don't think I is actually necessary in our equations. I don't think it's necessary for wave equations. I don't think it's necessary for an understanding of quantum theory at all. Um, I think what we need to do instead is um, figure out right a, a sort of way of um, understanding the passage of light through space without using waves without using wave functions. And this is gonna, this is a, a new idea, of course, this is completely novel. No one is really thinking about this idea at all. But um, what I'm describing is a background filled with tunneling electrons, right? So this is how you have to think about waves in the background. You have to think of a photon not really as an individual particle or a wave as such, but more like a virtual particle in the background. So all photons in the universe would be virtual particles, okay? And um, you've got this background, this kind of fuzzy uh, background filled with electrons, tunneling constantly, tunneling once every Planck time, and um, appearing and disappearing constantly in the background, emitting photons all the time, reuptaking photons all the time, and you get this kind of, um, I don't know if you can quite see that, like little dots there. Those would be the electrons tunneling in the background, and rather than being a wave at all, the photon, so-called, would be really more like a point particle, um, just going there in zigzags, literally, between electrons in the background. That would form its um, its uh, its wavelength. That would give us the give us the idea of its wavelength. It's um, just uh, bouncing between in a virtual sense, between electrons in the background, um, you know, being absorbed at, and re-emitted at the angle of incidence, so it follows the law of reflection, and uh, we can sort of integrate that within in Feynman's QED understanding of um, total internal reflection and things like this, and uh, we can get out of it classical physics, classical electrodynamics can come out of that, because um, if we take the integral of all such uh, interactions with photons, with um, atoms in a material, in a surface, we can still get out, you know, light bouncing off something according with, to, to the laws of classical electrodynamics, class classical um, physics. And we can get things bouncing off things according to the angle of incidence, right? So that's how that would work roughly but um yeah it I've, I've never really been very taken with this idea of waves in quantum theory and i think this this is something we're going to have to need to get away from in quantum theory and we're going to need to get away from wave equations generally speaking and wave mechanics and these sorts of things and yes sinusoidal waves and invoking i and euler's formula and all this sort of trigonometry stuff to um understand the propagation of waves in space yeah like we're gonna have to like that uh, it does create a good approximation of it it does roughly tell us what's going on you know it, like a photon traveling in these zigzags between background particles background electrons a virtual photon that is sort of is like a wave i do grant you that 
It's, it sort of seems to be that way. However, we're living in a sort of non-locally real universe. So um, what's really happening is an individual photon travels through, by the way, faster than light in this zigzag. It travels between each individual point on the background faster than the speed of light at c squared, um, not infinity, I don't think, or c to the fourth. I don't really know which it is. Um, I don't know what makes the maths make sense. But um, yeah, for all I know, it's c squared. For all I know, it's c to the fourth, traveling between these um, points on the background faster than the speed of light. Um, what we observe in a straight line with the virtual photons is the speed of light. However, um, yeah, it, it travels in a, in a diagonal, is absorbed by an electron in the background. The electron goes to somewhere else in the universe and another electron takes its place and emits a photon of a similar energy or very close to the same energy according to Pauli's exclusion principle. Since Pauli's exclusion principle states that no two particles in the universe can have exactly the same energy, so no photons, no two bosons or fermions can have both exactly the same energy in the universe, but they can have pretty close to the same energy. So, um, yeah, an electron of a similar energy comes in... I mean, well, when, it, when, the, when the exclusion principle applies to electrons, the mass of the electron is constant, obviously, or its or its um its its mass in its ground state, to be more precise, is constant, or its mass energy, to be more precise, is constant in its ground state. However, it always contains a photon of some description or another, and no two photons in the universe can have exactly the same energy. Of course, again, according to the exclusion principle. So um, what happens is by dint of the electron, which is not in its ground state usually, containing, if you like, a photon of a given indeterminate energy which is unique to that photon and um, not the same as any other photon in nature. What happens is that um, the, the hole that is, is left by the electron departing needs to be filled by another electron and it's always filled by the electron of the same, or sorry, as close to the mass energy of the of the electron that's departing and it has that mass energy by dint of its hold that similar mass energy by dint of its holding the most similar photon in the universe to the electron that's departed if you see what i mean so when these electrons in the background pop up in a different location they're always taking the place of the particle in the universe that has cl as close to pos as close to being as, as is possible, the same mass energy as the, the particle that's left, if you see what I mean. So when we when we detect photons in the universe traveling in these zigzags, which aren't the same photon each time between each um, point on the background, they um they uh they, they appear to be the same particle. Do you see what I mean? It's a very, very uh, persistent illusion, if you like, this um, this singular, well, um, this uniqueness of a particle, or this um, yeah, this very similitude between different photons. It seems to be the same photon, but it is not the same photon. It's a different photon. And that's what non-local non realism tell, tells us. So it's more apt to think of quantum tunneling as entangled, sorry, quantum entanglement as entangled tunneling. It's just two particles who've been forced together and forced to adopt something like the same mass energy in terms of their, their photon content, two electrons, say, and then they're separated by distance. So these two particles are just constantly tunneling between the different locations A and B. And... Um, one, you know, electron emits a photon. The photon within the, in the diamond bounces back. It's swallowed by the same electron again. Then it tunnels. Then the other electron takes its place, emits a photon, tunnels, and so you get this this changing of the electron spins um, between the different locations. And it appears to be spooky action at a distance, but it really is no such thing. It is just tunneling, really. <sighs> And if you take it out of um, the, the little diamond cavities in which the experiments like this are, are held within, 
then you then you enter a decoherent universe and it's um it's far harder to maintain those tunneling states if you receive me you know what i mean so that's why that happens um yeah i think i'll end this video on on those considerations i think that's probably enough for everyone to take in for the time being but um yeah i think this is one consequence of quantum gravity that we're going to have to update our understanding of the background to include something that is electromechanical in nature or electrodynamic in nature or quantum electrodynamic in nature and um update our understanding that integrates it with uh, electromagnetism really and we'll need to be able to reframe if we haven't done this to death really enough already the force of gravity as a consequence of electromagnetism or as a secondary effect of electromagnetism so we might stop considering gravity to be a fundamental force at all we might just consider there to be three forces in nature instead of four and um, it really is the strong, weak nuclear forces, but really the electro-weak force, right? And then we've got the gravito-electro-weak force or the electro-weak strong force. And um, yeah, perhaps it's just an obvious single force in nature, which is electromagnetism. And um, the weak, strong forces in gravity, those just uh, different manifestations of the same underlying uh, principle gauge interaction which is uh, the, the force of electromagnetism. And please don't shoot me over what I think about I. <laughs> um, and it not being a real number. Well, of course, it isn't a real number. Like, then again, when it comes to numbers that aren't real numbers, I don't know what you mean by a number that isn't a real number. <laughs> well, it's like some sort of weird rotation. What are you talking about? It's gobbledygook. <laughs> Like, we don't need it in physics, I don't think. I don't think we do. No, there I said it. And that, that Seamus guy from 60 Symbols, he said, but there's some very respectable physics papers out there that suggest we don't need I at all. So that's what I think of you, I, your horrible little mathematical bit of nonsense bullshit. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. I love you lots. Bye.